This week I'm talking about ministry relationships, ministry relationships. As a guest speaker, I am bringing a passage of scripture that I can pretty much guarantee no other guest speakers preached on here. And the reason I can guarantee that is because it's a list of names. And we're going to get that to in just a few minutes. We're going to be in 2 Timothy, if you want to start t- turning there, 2 Timothy at the end. But uh, I, I'm the kind of guy who, like most of us, likes scrolling online on social media. And, and when I see a meme, I basically always have to stop and read a meme. Anybody else out there like that that just reads memes like constantly, even maybe follow meme accounts? It's kind of ridiculous, honestly, when you look at it. But some of the friendship memes that jumped up to me as I was kind of scrolling around was one, one said this, a friend will pick you up when you fall down right after they finish laughing. Anybody have a friend like that? My wife, anytime I get hurt, she always goes, huh? and she has a huge smile. Are you okay? I'm like, why, are you, why the smile first? Why the question? How about this one? You, when you need them, a good friend will come to your house and knock on your door. When you need them, a best friend lets himself in and starts eating your food. Anybody have a friend like that? You like get home and you're like, you're in my house. You're in my fridge. Like, what, what do you do? Friends don't let you do stupid things alone, right? Alone. They let you do stupid things all the time. They just want to make sure that they're, they're with you. You know, ministry is relationships. And ministry occurs in the context of relationships. There is really nothing that we do outside of relationship. And and. Thomas Aquinas, a 13th century theologian, said this, there is nothing on this earth more prized than true friendship. There is nothing on this earth more prized than true friendship. Hundreds of years ago, it rang true, and it rings true today. When we jump into this letter of 2 Timothy, this last epistle, I want to give you a little bit of background about what it is that we're going to jump into, because we're going to read this text, and you're going to go, that's the part I always skip. All the names, anybody want to just be honest enough to say, I I skip the lists of names when I'm reading the Bible. No condemnation here. That's the part I always skip. So let's give you a little context of what we're going to jump into as we learn about ministry relationships. The Apostle Paul had a great ministry on planet Earth. Would you agree with that, yes or no? Yes. God used the Apostle Paul in some fantastic, phenomenal ways. He grabbed a man who was a violent aggressor of the church, right, known as Saul of Tarsus, who persecuted Christians unto death. He was a zealous person. And yet when God grabbed a hold of him, his life was changed. And God used this man, Paul, to write the better part of our New Testament. Authored through the Holy Spirit, Paul starts just on fire for what God would do and the things of God and helping the church of God and building relationships all over the Mediterranean, all over the ancient world for the glory of God. When he writes this letter, 2 Timothy, I want you to remember and keep in your context and frame of mind of all the letters that he wrote, this is the last one. The Apostle Paul had faced death so many times and stared right down death, but this time he knows that something's different. There is a new leader in Rome. His name is Nero. And Nero absolutely hates the Christian movement. He's actually going to utilize the Christian movement to set up Christians, Nero is, and he's going to start a fire as history uh, tells us that he starts a fire in Rome and burns half of Rome to the ground and then he blames the Christians. And he uses it as an opportunity to light Christians literally on fire for entertainment. And so as the Apostle Paul sits in prison this time, he knows something's different. Other times, there's other prison epistles, right? The written letters of Paul, as he sits in prison, we call them prison epistles. Some of those prison epistles was more like house arrest. But this time when he sits in prison, it is not house arrest at all. It is a cold, dark, gruesome prison cell. He knows that it's different, and he knows he's at the end. So where we're going to jump in is the very last letter that Paul wrote, at the very end of that letter. And this is a pastoral epistle. Uh, The Apostle Paul wrote three different letters that we call pastoral epistles. Why do we call them pastoral epistles? Because they're written to pastors, young pastors. One of those is Titus. The other one is 1 Timothy. And then 2 Timothy. 
The Apostle Paul has his protégés. He has his other younger followers that he is instructing specifically to their churches in their context, what they're going through. If you as a young leader inside of your church and you want to make sure that you are following the Lord Jesus Christ with everything inside of you and you wanted to be discipled by the Apostle Paul himself, you would open up Titus First Timothy, in 2 Timothy and you'd say, what were the things that they were dealing with? What an amazing letter that we have given to us by God himself. What we're going to read is, we're going to read a list of 17 names. And again, I kind of jumped ahead to this, this statement of ministry occurs in the context of relationships. When I went to Trinity International University, Pastor Andy was there as well. Trinity banged that drum so many times, they just said it over and over and over and over again. I'm going to have you guys repeat it with me. Are you ready? Let's say this out loud. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships. You have never ministered to anyone in your life without relationship. Maybe the relationship is this deep. Maybe I only know them in this context. Maybe it was 30 seconds. Maybe there was a relationship. Even if it started out online and it was a one-way relationship, They know you through this avenue, whatever it is. That's the beginning of the relationship. That's where it starts, amen? When we learn about relationships, we got to remember what it is that we're put on this planet Earth to do. God didn't put us here to do a bunch of tasks. He didn't need you to do all this heavy lifting of all of the frivolous things that we get involved with in life. He, He put us here for relationship, a relationship with him first and a relationship with those people that are around us. Whether it's five minutes or five years, it's still a relationship. So what I'm going to do as we go through here, we're going to have more points than usual in the sermon because there's a lot going on with all these names. And we're going to look at the relational seasons of your life. Every life has seasons. And whether it's your college season or a certain season that you worked in a certain workplace or a season at one church and you move to another church, you move to a different area or a different state. I was talking with somebody from Iowa this morning. Your life is full of seasons. I was talking with somebody earlier this week, and they were going through what they described as the most difficult season in their life. This is the hardest thing that I've gone through in my life. And my encouragement is, it's a season. Friends, it's a season. Do seasons last forever? No. Is that season the end? No. Don't ever think that your season will last forever. It won't. We're stepping into a new season right now, right? We're looking forward to summer. Your season will change. It's a beautiful thing, and sometimes it's a difficult reality. You say, Pastor Ben, my season is really good right now. I'm like, great. Great, but I'm telling you, your season will change, and it'll get hard at times, and then it'll change, and it'll get good again. I look through the audience. I see Donna over there picking her out a little bit. She loves gardening, and gardening reminds you of change, does it not? Does a garden stay the same throughout the entire year? It does not. Seasons change and ministry occurs in the context of relationships and you've had relationships come and go throughout your life and you would think maybe that that time was in vain. Maybe it was worthless. Why did I get to know that person? Why did that happen like that? I can't tell you assuredly why. But I can tell you that it was not in vain. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships and Our God is a God of seasons and change. God knows what he's doing, and we can trust him, amen? Pastor Ben, enough. Let's get to the text, all right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. Make every effort to come to me soon. Remember the dire position that Paul is in. The very last of his letters. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Like, that's why I skip all those words, right? I don't know those names. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left in Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. 
Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be made fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Do you believe that, friends? To him be the glory and glory forever and ever. Amen. And you think it's done, but he's got some more details he wants to throw in there. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anisiphorus. Erastus reminded me at Corinth, remained with me at Corinth. But Trophimus I left at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Prudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. I love reading through these. I love getting in the Apostle Paul's head a little bit. You guys like jumping into Scripture and just sitting there with it a little bit and actually creatively imagining what it would be like to be Paul. First point is this, seasons of need. Relational seasons with people will bring you seasons of need. And the Apostle Paul himself, the great Titan Paul, is a season of need. Do your best to come to me quickly, he says in verse 9. Do your best to get here before winter. I asked kind of a rhetorical question today, so no eyeballs looking around the room, no elbows, right? Do you know a needy person? Do you know a needy person? Somebody in your life, they're always asking your opinion for something, and then they're not, never taking it, you know, and they're, they're always asking for your help for something in their garage or over their house or whatever. You, you know, a needy person, I know a couple needy people. It's bad if you're the needy person. Maybe you're like, no, I don't have that, but I'm always calling so-and-so. It's like, you're the needy person. Here's the thing. It's bad if you're always the needy person, but can I tell you this? For a season, it's expected. For a season, it's expected. You ever know someone that's going through the most difficult time in their entire life and they tell no one? Or they have great need and they're not always pestering people for stuff and just saying, hey, you know, they don't do that. But yet they have great need and they don't ask for help. There are seasons of need, friends. We all have them. It's expected. It is for a season It won't last forever. Some of us men, we're we're terrible at this. We're like, I won't ask for help. I don't don't do that. I've heard a guy say that once. Oh, I don't don't do that. Don't do what? Ask for help? You're going to lift a 5,000-pound elephant yourself? Seasons of need, have you found yourself there? Here's, Here's the question here out of this point. Do you know someone going through a season of need? The Apostle Paul had need. How can you help them? Not fix everything, not meddle in everything in their life, but how can you just come alongside them and just gently help them? How can you encourage them? I've had people come to me and say, hey, Pastor Ben, you know, uh, so-and-so is in the hospital, and this is kind of what's going on, and I, I want to help, and I just don't know what to do, and, and I never have the right words, and, and, and what would I ever say? And I'm like, say nothing. Just be there first pastor that I had the opportunity to kind of work with. I was doing an internship, and he had this this phrase that he would use, the ministry of presence. He said, you know what? The ministry of presence is when you just show up. The ministry of presence is when you just sit there, you don't have the answers, and you don't have the perfect Bible verse, and you don't try to help them look on the sunny side of life, and you just show up, and you're just there. How many of you guys would enjoy the ministry of presence when you're going through your season of need and you say, so-and-so was there? Maybe some of you guys have been in that season, you know, so-and-so was there and our, our relationship changed because of nothing that they said. It's a season of need and they were there. I can tell you in my life, uh, you know, we had an unexpected tragedy in my life where my dad died very unexpectedly. And it was hard. Strong Christian man, pillar of our family, patriarch for sure. It shook our family. And I could get descriptive about it, but some of you guys know, right? 
when it's just tragic and, and instant and quick and you're like, what just happened? No one could say the right thing in that moment, right? There's nothing that could be said that just turns it around. And, oh, great. But the ministry of presence happened. And, and I remember we set up a 10 by 10, one of those little pop-up awnings in the backyard of the house, and people were just coming out to my dad's place. And we had a cooler set out with drinks, and we just had some tables set up, and people would just come and sit. We all have seasons in life. The Apostle Paul included, and I'm encouraging you, if you know someone in a season of need, if it's a perpetual, constant thing, you cannot help them eternally to pull them out of that. There's nothing that you could say, but there are people in your life where it's just a season where you know there's something specific happening And I don't know the right thing to say, and I don't know the right thing to do, but I can be there. I hope I'm preaching to somebody this morning who's going through that season of need. And I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul had that. And he wrote to Timothy. He said, do your best to come to me quickly. The next one is this, seasons of love lost. You will have seasons in your life of relational seasons with people, ministry relationships, Seasons of love lost. Verse 10 says this, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You ever been deserted or had a Christian friend that was there for a while and then they were gone? It's interesting when you do a little bit of study into this man, Demas. At one point, Demas was a wonderful Christian worker building God's church. Demas is mentioned three times in the New Testament, and two of those times are good. The third time... Is here. Demas did not endure. Demas did not persevere. Colossians 4 verse 14 says this. The Apostle Paul writing the book of Colossians says, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, also Demas. Demas was there with Paul and he was there with Luke doing God's work. In Philemon chapter 1 verse 23, he says this, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark, uh, Aristocras, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. Demas is listed as a fellow worker written by the hand of Paul himself. Somewhere along the line, Demas' love for Christ changed. It was a season. It was a season where everything appeared like he was doing good. A season where he looked like he had this heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he turned was once a passionate love for God turned cold and was replaced for a love of the world. As Paul says, seasons of love lost. You know, and in seasons, there are seasons of heat, right? And seasons of cold. What season are you in when you're with your relationship with Christ? If you want to be honest, you can be honest and say, you know what? At this point in my life, there was a time where I was more passionate for the things of God, more dedicated to the life of Christ more willing to endure persecution and persevere for God than I am right now, if I was honest. And I say, dude, it's best to be honest, right? And not posture. It's a season, and you went through a season, and maybe a season is not the best season. I would encourage you, look to Jesus Christ. Demas loved the world. And it's sad because so often love isn't like lost. Love gets replaced. They see that so much. In in Christian ministry, you have the opportunity to sit with families a lot. And you have the opportunity to sit inside of marriages that are not doing well. And you have conversations with people in the midst of their very hardship and this dark season that they're going through. And what you realize some point through the conversation is this person's love has been replaced. They're following someone else. There's infidelity happening here. There's they're cheating. The love wasn't lost. It's not a love grown cold for this person. It's a love that's been impassioned against towards someone else, and it's just been removed from the situation. And I would I would say this: in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the same thing. Maybe there was a time in your life where you were chasing the things of the world, and God came in because the things of the world were not pleasing you, they were not filling you, they didn't have the allure that they once did, and you realized, and life is so much more than all this stuff. In some way, that either somebody introduced you to Christ or you started reading the Bible or you found something online that turned your sights and your affections towards God in heaven and you're growing in him, 
And you're like, that was a season, but it's not that way now. I would say this, where have you directed your affections? Because your affections are still there. They just may be pursuing someone else or something else. 1 John 2.15 says this, do not love the world. Don't do it. Or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I would say this, do you love the world? Where is your affections for the world greater than your affections for the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I tell you, those affections will lead you astray, and that thing in the world will fail you. I guarantee it. God will never fail you. He won't do it your way all the time, but he won't fail you. Next one is this, seasons of faithful interdependence. Paul went through a season of faithful interdependence. Verse 10 says this, Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Verses 19 through 21 is, again, that goes through this list. Greek Priscilla, Aquila, Onesiphorus, Erastus, Miletus, Trophimus. There's 11 people in those verses. Faithful interdependence, it looks like this. Faithful interdependence in the body of Christ is when you're connected and you're doing ministry together and God is glorified and God is being honored. It is taking your gifts and your abilities and your resources and it's doing things to glorify God in heaven and your families start to flourish and your community starts to flourish. Faithful interdependence. The Apostle Paul saw this all over. In different times in his life, he saw it and he's saying, greet these people, encourage these people. By God's grace, this is what it looks like when we carry out his good work. It looks like Bible studies, pancake breakfast, service projects, and more. Like all those silly, cheesy Christian ministry things. That's faithful interdependence. Paul says, Cretans has gone to Galatia. There was a relationship there with Paul. Paul stopped by Galatia in all three of his missionary journeys. He stopped by his friend, Cretans, in Galatia to see how things were going. There's a relationship there. Titus to Dalmatia. Titus is the other pastoral epistle. When Paul wanted to encourage a young pastor specific to the ministry context of the things that he was going through, Paul sat down and wrote to Titus. And yet he mentions him right at the very end of his last letter. What Christian brothers and sisters do you depend on? What Christian brothers and sisters do you know there's faithful interdependence going on? Who do you do the work of the Lord with? Who are you raising your kids with? Interdependence is not a one-sided dependence, right? It doesn't just go one way. Interdependence is not independence. It's not just you exerting yourself over your friends. As fun as that can be sometimes, right? I tell my friends what to do. It's interdependent. And I want to talk even just, just briefly for the students and the youth the college students and the 20-year-olds. You can't live the Christian life on your own. You can't go to school day in, day out, and keep your faith in Jesus Christ to yourself. You have to become faithfully interdependent with other Christian believers. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships. You cannot keep this thing siloed to a few streams in your internet you know, profiles and stuff like that. You have to take it into the real world. You have to find real people. And I'm telling you, some of you older folks, whatever that means, don't we, wherever you are in your workplace, you cannot do it alone. Paul didn't. He didn't. There's 17 people in this list, some good, some bad. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships. The next one is this, seasons of friendships restored. Seasons of friendships restored. Verse 11, he says this, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Kind of interesting, the background on Mark, also sometimes in your Bible is called John Mark, another author of the gospel of Mark. Acts 13.5 describes Mark as a helper, quote, helper to the apostle Paul and Barnabas in their first missionary journey. But by Acts 15, Paul won't take Mark with them again. 
Because Mark had abandoned Paul on an earlier journey. They were doing work together and things got hot and it got difficult and Mark took off. And later on when the Apostle Paul is going to go on a missionary journey, I guess Barnabas brings up like, hey man, we should bring Mark with us on this. Apostle Paul says, absolutely not. He abandoned us. He's not a faithful worker. He's weak. He's not dedicated to this thing. He'll turn and run. The Apostle Paul, when you read into sometimes his character and stuff, you get these glimmers of this, this zealous person. These people in the Bible were real friends. They weren't just fictitious stories. Paul says, I got no time for somebody like Mark who will turn and run when the going gets hard. Absolutely not. I will not take him on the, on the missionary journey. Barnabas gets upset. Barnabas takes Mark with him and then Paul takes Silas and then they have two groups. See how God uses that? God can use it even in our, even in our weakness. <laughs> but God can restore relationships. Here's what we should learn. The early apostles and disciples had disagreements and arguments. If you don't know much about the Bible, you might think when you read about these guys and these characters in these stories that, that, that they're perfect and they do things right all the time. And it's absolutely not true, right? For those of us who live inside this book and we're reading it all the time and we're like, these guys were not perfect. They didn't do it just right all the time. The early apostles had disagreements. But there are seasons of friendships restored. Just because you have a disagreement with a friend right now, maybe you have a family member that, and it's just not going well. If both parties dedicate themselves to Christ, to following Christ, that relationship can be restored. It may look very much different. It probably should. But there are seasons of friendships restored. Let's go to the next one. Seasons of attack. Verse 14, seasons of attack. Maybe you've been in this season in your life. Verse 14 says, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. When you think of the Apostle Paul and all the things that he endured, the beatings, being, you know, uh, shipwrecked, stoned, left for dead. When he says, this dude did me a lot of harm, you wonder, what did he do? You know, what in the world happened there? Paul says, the Lord will repay him for what he was done. Will Paul repay Alexander for what he did? No. Is it up to Paul to make sure Alexander gets his? No. Have you taken up that leverage against someone who's done something against you? Have you been the one that says, I will exact for them? They said something about me online. They did this. I will get them. They will know my name when this is done. You ever exert your strength when someone comes after you? The Apostle Paul says this, the Lord will repay him. You could do your worst and it's nothing compared to God's justice. Amen? God will do it just right. We're sloppy in what we do. God will do it just right. But Paul says you two should be on guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Some people strongly oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you will be elevating the Lord's name and they will not like it. And there will be aggressive nature out of them that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Are they opposing you? No. They're opposing Christ. Does it feel like they're opposing you? <laughs> yeah. They're like, dude, you're like, dude, what is your problem? What is their problem? Why won't they give up? Why are they doing this against me? Why do they got this out for my family? Why, 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 why? It feels very personal every single time. The Apostle Paul understands this. And the Apostle Paul didn't say, I'm going to take it. The Apostle Paul probably could have said, hey, I've got, I, got some, I got some dudes in my past that would dish out some vengeance. Paul calls, calls up like some former gangsters, you know? No, no. That just reminded me of a funny story. I, a little time for a funny, goofy story. I had a friend, when I first started walking with Christ, um, when I was a teenager, I was into like, I don't know, skateboards, baggy clothes, lots of drugs, and loud music. I, I, should, I shouldn't say, can I get an amen? It's like, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> that was my life, man. That was my life, and God changed my life, and I started getting into the things of God and seeing long-term. I started, the community I was trying to tear down, 
literally my hometown, I, I always laugh because I like, I tried to tear down this community with my own two teenage hands, you know. I tried to. And God just changed my heart for my community. But I had this friend, uh, I had these, I had all kinds of speakers and I gave some subs to a friend of mine and we were all graduating from high school. We were going all of our different ways. And I remember um, I started walking with Christ, and so I was like, hey, before we all go our own separate ways, can I get my speakers back? I had an amp and some stuff in his car. He looked me in the face, and he goes, what speakers? What amp? Like, dude, the one in your car, the, like in your car right now, those ones that were mine. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. So I just took a deep breath. I'm like, oh, Okay. And I was talking with one of my other friends who was a former gangster, literally in a gang. He, he's like, dude, that guy, that kid drives a Ford Taurus. I can be in and out of that car in 30 seconds, literally, no problem. I'll get your, I'll get your speakers back this afternoon. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Just called him off, called him off. Dude, is it, it ain't worth it, right? Sometimes it's not worth it. The get back's just not worth it. Cut it, cut it off, let it go. And I told my friend, I said, dude, Jesus is bigger than those subs, and my relationship with Christ means more. My testimony to my friend, maybe someday I'll be able to witness to him. And I didn't break into his car and take some speakers. Seasons of attack. People push against the message of Jesus Christ. You notice in that seasons of attack, verse 15, if you've got your Bibles, I, I, again, I'd encourage you, underline stuff in there. Make it your own. And if you don't like underlining your Bible, have a notebook and write in that thing. He says, because he strongly opposed our message, Alexander was against the message. What message? You guys hear it all the time in this church. It's the gospel message. The gospel means good news, right? The message of the apostle Paul to the ancient world is God is real. And he will exact judgment and justice on everyone. No one will escape. No one will die and look in a mirror and say, did I do very good? Did I do okay in this life? I think so. You don't look in a mirror. You look in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, the divine judge. You say, Pastor Ben, that sounds really scary. That's like a turn and burn hellfire message. Jesus talked about it more than anybody else. It's his message. He says, God is a righteous judge, and he has given you an opportunity to live this life, and if you live it for yourself, you will squander it every single time, and you will hurt the people around you, willingly or unwillingly. You say, man, I made a friend cry one time, and I didn't even mean to. You mean you don't have control over your your life? You don't know the consequences of your actions? The gospel message is is a message from God himself that says, you will mess it up. And I will come down as a perfect substitutionary lamb. This is all getting weird and it's real church work, church words now, Pastor Ben. I don't know, substitutionary. If your life is a sacrifice to God, your life isn't good enough because you already messed it up. You can't do it good enough. And God says, I know this. (laughs) I know this about you guys. I created you. So I will come down perfect and I will do everything just right. And all you do is put your faith and trust in that. If you were to die today and you were to appear before the heavenly gates, what would you say to God? You don't say anything about, I went to church, I think I did it okay, I helped an old lady across the street, I I think I was good enough, I think I did enough. It's never that. Jesus Christ, that's what you say. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus did it right. Jesus is good enough. Jesus is in there and I know him. That's what you could say. Oh man, what a great message that the Apostle Paul had. He lived his whole life for this message. Once he understood it changed everything. And I know there's people in this room and it's the same way for us. Once we knew the message, once we heard God's good word, once we felt that call, we're never the same. And yet we go through seasons of attack. Are they attacking us? No. Do we need to exact vengeance? No. It's good news. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships, and there's so many relationships 
that we go through in this life, and they all look so, many, so different, and the seasons come, and the seasons go, and we have seasons of need, and seasons of love lost, and seasons of faithful interdependence, and seasons of friendship restored, and seasons of attack, and the last season with people is this. And then we have some seasons with the Lord we'll go through, because Paul ends there. Seasons of abandonment. Seasons of abandonment. This one's the hardest, I think. There are some of us in this room that have never gone through a season of abandonment. We really actually don't know what it is. We've had hard times, but we haven't gone through this. Others of us know exactly what this feels like. Verse 16 says this, At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Those are big words. May it not be held against them. I think this is probably the hardest of the relational seasons to be abandoned. Think of the Apostle Paul's ministry. And some of you guys, I don't know, I don't know Apostle Paul's life real well. This guy's traveling all over. He's sharing the gospel. He's doing all those huge, fanciful things that you imagine what it would be like if you were a missionary going into these different cities and towns. You're just finding people to talk to and you're telling them about Jesus. It's the most fanciful. Use your imagination. And people are coming to faith in Christ and people are getting baptized. And the Apostle Paul says, I don't even know the names of some of the people that I baptized. I don't even remember. And and all these things are happening. And families are being restored and people are even being healed. And, and, and it's amazing. And it's amazing. And it's amazing. And Paul goes on trial. Nobody's there. Put yourself in his shoes. Think of all those places that you went and all those people that you saw and all those smiles that came on the faces through the shed tears of their salvation and they're thinking, I don't have to worry about my death. I don't have to worry about my life. I, God is real and God will take care of me in this. And Jesus Christ rose from death and if he can do that, he can help me where I'm at. And he can help me in the next life. And Paul's smiling with them and he's saying, yes, Absolutely. But in Paul's dark time, none of them were there. It's, it's, it's crazy to put yourself at the end of this letter and to read through these names and to imagine what he's really going through, what it really feels like, and he's sitting in this prison cell. We don't want to be those people who didn't show up. Amen? We don't want to be those people. We want to be the Christ follower that has eyes to see other people hurting. And we're not going to show up and tell them how they can live their life better. We're going to show up and we're going to have a ministry of presence. We're going to be there. Hebrews 10.38 is is quoting Habakkuk chapter 2. And it says this, "My My righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This world hates the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much shrinking back. Then it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, but we are not among those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith for the safekeeping of the soul. We will not shrink back when it gets hard, amen? We can't, we won't, we just won't have that testimony. Let's ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be the person who would be with us in our season of need and we wouldn't shrink back and we wouldn't not show up and we wouldn't have friends going through the hardest time in their life and the world persecuting them. And we stay silent because we know the second that we say something, you think that a Christian wanted to show up with Nero on the throne and say, yeah, the Apostle Paul, this guy that was living so outrightly for Christ, if I associate myself with him, you know what that's going to do to me? I'm going to be the next torch in Nero's garden. Again, I think about the students today. You know Christian in your school who's outspoken about their faith, and you go, dude, if I associate with that kid and that girl, my social credibility will be nothing. Don't leave them out to dry. Don't leave them out there on their own. Some of those people that are online that are a little bit weird because they're Christian people, they're dropping like Christian stuff all the time. Encourage them a little bit. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships. And this is where Paul starts to wrap up. This is good news. He says this, but the Lord stood with me. I want you to say that out loud with me. But the Lord stood with me. What if nobody shows up? The Lord stood with me. And what did he do? He strengthened me. He strengthened me. 
Verse 17, the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. Did he, did he encourage Paul just so Paul could have a happy life? No, heavens no. So the message could be proclaimed, fully proclaimed that all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Here's the thing. The apostle Paul died. <laughs> right? He says, I'm delivered from the lion's mouth. Why? Because God is the one who sets him free. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Right? To live as Christ. Did Jesus Christ have an easy life? No. To live as Christ, to die is gain. He says, man, that's the best deliverance of them all. Is the Lord with you enough? Is the Lord with you enough for you? It's interesting for me. I find that so many people, they just want the thing, whatever it is they're praying for like crazy, and it's this thing or this person. Is the Lord with you enough? You know, you know God throughout the whole Old Testament repeatedly told all of his faithful over and over and over again, when he asked them to do something difficult, when he asked them to do something beyond them, greater than them, something they couldn't do on their own, over and over and over again, he said what? I will be with you. That was all he promised. He never said, hey, when you go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, like, man, it's going to be so easy. I'm going to show up, kaboom, it'll be done, I'll flatten them. He didn't say that. He promised Moses, he promised Jacob, he promised Joshua, he promised Solomon. He says, I'll be with you. Pop quiz, nobody likes Bible pop quizzes, so this one will be easy. If you're found in Jesus Christ, will the Lord be with you? Will he be with you? Is that enough? Amen. Is that enough? It's like, dude, the Lord will be with me. The Lord will be with me. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you were truly alone? No. God is with you. God will be with you wherever you go. God will strengthen you. Will you look to him? Or will you look to your phone and scroll when it gets hard? Will you just sequester up in your hole? I got my spot in my house and I'm just going to close everybody off. Go to the Lord. And he says this, the Lord will rescue me Verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Will the Lord rescue you? Will he bring you safely to heaven? Need you worry about any attack? Need you to worry about going to heaven? I don't know if I've been good enough. You don't need to worry about these things. Seasons of relationship, make sure that this season, your relationship with God is a good one. Make sure that you've cast everything else aside and laid your eyes and fixed your eyes wholly and solely on him and say, hey, Lord, I got to go to work tomorrow and I got to go to school and I got all these other things going on in my life. I have some responsibilities you have given me these days and they're numbered. So I'll be faithful in those things and I'll be the friend that you call me to be and I'll, I'll try to be there, Lord, and, and, and I'll keep my eyes on you. In the end, Lord, even in being faithful in this world, I know in the end I will see you face to face. And that will give me the strength for tomorrow. And I know you're going to rescue me out of the hardship I find myself in right now. How do I know? I know it by faith. I know it because he said it. And I know it because he did it time and time and time again. It's not just some hocus pocus, pomp, you know, Positive sermon, positive speech. It's the truth written in God's word from a man who's sitting in a prison cell ready to die. The Lord will rescue me and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Paul says, I'm ready to go. And this is the last point as the worship team can start to make their way up and we'll have some takeaways here. The Lord knows the real you. The Lord knows the real you. There's a lot of us today that feels like nobody actually knows the real me. I've never been the real me. I've never let myself out, so to speak, and let people know the real me. It's, here's the thing. Sometimes we're so busy in this generation making ourselves out to what we see online. And so we try to, and we say, the real me is like these four people. I want to be like that. That's not the real you. You're following all these people. It's a whole other sermon. Who do you follow See, the real 
one who made you knows the real you. Verse 22 says, the Lord be with your spirit. Paul is talking to Timothy, his friend in the faith. Timoth- Paul's in his 60s. Timothy's in his 30s at this point. Paul's lived his whole life. And Paul says that Timothy is a very good friend who they did ministry for about 15 years together. Paul says, the Lord be with your spirit. In other words, God be with you in this. God be right there with you in this. Timothy needs to know that God is with him at a very soul level. Don't you just want someone to know the real you? Wouldn't that be awesome for someone to know the real you? You know God knows you. He created you. He knows what goes on in your mind. He knows what your aspirations, hopes, and dreams are. He he knows the things that people are saying about you and to you. And he knows all of these things. He knows the real you. Ministry occurs in the context of relationships. And there's a couple application questions that will come up on the screen for you to look at. What relational season are you in? What has God brought you through? What healthy relationships are there in my life? And am I investing properly into these relationships? When and where are you most aware of God's presence? When do you know that God is with you? When do you sense that closeness? Do you go there often? Some of us know exactly what that is. They're like, man, I like to get out to Lake Michigan and just sit out there. It's like, do you do that a lot? Because you should. Pastor Ben, I got I I a coffee shop I like to go to, and I just pull out my Bible. I throw some earbuds in, and, and the Lord is there. Do you go there a lot? I hope you do. Meet with him. Yet there's others here today that just know that no one really knows me. God knows you. God knows the real you. Let's pray to him as we wrap up this sermon and let's come to him for some of you guys <laughs> you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ and you hear it from this stage a lot just keep just do it and keep going and trust him but, but Pastor Ben I'm going through this thing and I don't know how it's going to turn out you don't but God does let's come to him now Lord Jesus we find it encouraging today to think about the fact that ministry occurs in the context of relationships and that you want to initiate a relationship with us. You start there. And then, God, you don't leave us there, but then you use us to minister to those people around us. Father God, there are mothers and fathers in this room, and you want them to be ministers of your gospel to their kids and coworkers. Father God, there's sons and daughters in this room. You're not leaving them alone, Lord. You're ministering to them. You have a relationship with them, and you're calling them to share that goodness with others. And God, yet we're we're afraid at times because we know we will be persecuted. We know people don't like the name of Jesus. It seems so weird that Jesus would have such a great love for them, but that they would turn from him. And they would want to go their own way, and they would look at the Bible and call it this book of fairy tales and bigoted racism and all the lies that they spew about your word, Lord Jesus. It's a lie. And they're running from the truth, but one day, Lord, they'll see you face to face. And I know that there's some people in the room, God, and even some people online that would listen and they would say, I want a relationship with this Christ that would encourage a man at the end of his life in a prison cell to stay faithful. Lord Jesus, we turn from our sin, we repent, we agree with you, and we say, Lord, the best way we know how, we believe that Jesus Christ is your perfect sacrifice, that he did it just right. And we will try to live a brand new life in you, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit guiding us and whispering in our ear to do the things that you'd call us to do. And Lord, when we are unfaithful, we know that you are faithful. And we have a faith family right here that we can turn to and talk with and be encouraged by. Lord Jesus, we love you and we trust you. God, may we praise you now in glory for your goodness and join our voices together and join heaven as we sing, Lord. You receive praise and you receive honor and you receive glory from this day forward forever, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As a church, it is our honor to be a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out more about what your next steps can be at Kenosha City Church, All you have to do is go to kenosha.church slash next steps. Thanks again for joining us today.